Uh, Henry Van Dyke tells the story of uh, the keeper of the light, a uh, young daughter in her, uh, of a light ke- uh, lighthouse keeper inherited her father's work upon his death. The ship bringing supplies to this little coastal village uh, was overdue for over a week and uh, people were running out of food and they decided they would have to use the oil for the lighthouse uh, for food. But this young girl knew it was extremely important to keep the lighthouse lit. So she locked herself in the lighthouse and, and defended it with an old firearm of her father's. She risked her life to keep that lighthouse lit. And uh, a couple days later, uh, the ship bringing supplies for the town uh, arrived. Uh, Had the lighthouse been out, the ship may likely have shipwrecked and uh, many people in this uh, town could have died. Like the keeper of the lighthouse, Christians have something sacred to defend. The doctrine of the reliability of the Bible. Most of what we know about God and Christ we learn from Scripture. If we lose our faith in the authoritative Bible, our whole faith is put in peril. I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask questions after the message. So if uh, you think of something while I'm talking, or you want to ask me anything about the Bible... Or maybe something somebody said to you about why they don't believe the Bible, why it's not true, uh, th- that would be the time uh, to do it. On June 26, 2000, ABC's Peter Jennings delivered a special report called The Search for Jesus. He made numerous outrageous statements about what we now know about Christ's life. There was no visitation of angels announcing Christ's birth. No star in the east. No wise men from the east. Jesus was not born in Bethlehem. The virgin birth is a myth. A Roman soldier probably impregnated Mary, and Jesus was illegitimate. No Jesus walking on the water. No turning water into wine. No feeding the 5,000. No raising Lazarus from the dead. These stories were invented by the gospel writers as advertisement for Christianity against Judaism and Greek and Roman paganism. Jesus was not buried but left on the cross to be eaten by birds and wild dogs. He was quoting Robert Funk, John Dominic Croissant, and Marcus Borg of the Jesus Seminar. Uh, Marcus Borg is of interest because he's a hometown boy. He taught at Oregon State for, I think, like 45 years. He died just four years ago. Uh, Anybody here ever take a course from Marcus Borg? No. Anybody ever heard of Marcus Borg or read anything about him? Several of you. Jennings made these statements as if they were the consensus of the best biblical scholarship today. Uh, Parents, when you send your son or daughter off to college, you need to prepare them for statements like these. A teenager, when you go to high school or college, you need to be prepared to answer these kind of objections. What Peter Jennings did not tell people was the composition of the Jesus Seminar participants. Uh, Parents, you must teach your sons and daughters that Uh, When a professor says something, they don't have to believe everything they say is true. They need to know their viewpoint. Uh, It's the same when you read the news today or you watch the news on television. You can't just assume that everything you're being told is true. You have to know the author and their viewpoint. And then what you need to ask for, well, give me a counterpoint. If this is what you're saying, what's the obvious viewpoint? Like today, should we go to war with Iran? Okay, there's this viewpoint. Well, what's the counterpoint? Why we should not? Should we impeach President Trump? This is this point. What would be the counter argument for not to impeach him? Until you know both, you can't possibly have an informed opinion. To evaluate what you hear or read, you must ascertain the author's viewpoint. So let's look at the viewpoint of the members of the Jesus Seminar. The Jesus Seminar was a group of theologians 
that met two times a year from 1985 to 2005. Although the Jesus Seminar claimed to reflect a consensus of modern scholarship, this claim was false. Of the 74 involved in the seminar, only 14 were among leading names in modern uh, historical Jesus scholarship. The two best known were John Dominic Croson of DePaul University and Marcus Borg of Oregon State. 20 were less published, but they deserved the title scholar. So that's 22. The other 54 were relative unknowns who had written nothing on New Testament scholarship. 36 of the group, almost half, had a degree from or taught at Harvard, Claremont, or Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, universities with some of the most liberal departments of New Testament studies anywhere in the world. In short, the Jesus Seminar did not even come remotely close to representing an adequate comp, uh, cross-section of contemporary New Testament scholarship. At best, its members represented the radical fringe. The most detailed summary of their findings appeared in a book entitled, The Five Gospels, What Did Jesus Really Say? The volume prints all of the passages attributed to Jesus found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the apocryphal gospel of Thomas and color codes the words attributed to Jesus. Red means Jesus undoubtedly said this. Pink, Jesus probably said something like this. Gray, Jesus did not say this, but the ideas represent somewhat his thought. And black, Jesus did not say this. This was made up by writers who wrote decades after Jesus' death. The reason the seminar received so much attention was because they concluded that a full 82% of the words ascribed to Jesus in the Gospels were not actually spoken by him. They colored less than 20% of the words in the Gospels attributed to Jesus in the New Testament in red or pink, and well over half were in black. In the entire Gospel of Mark, there's only one red-letter verse, and virtually the entire Gospel of John is in black. Their conclusions become more understandable when you recognize that the Jesus Seminar established far too restrictive principles for what Jesus could say. They concluded that Jesus only spoke in parables or aphorisms. In other words, he never had a conversation with a person that's kind of normal, or if he healed somebody, there was a conversation that went along with it. Jesus only spoke in parables or wise cryptic sayings. So they got rid of all his dialogue. Um, they didn't allow him to quote the Old Testament. He wasn't allowed to give any prophecies. Uh, he couldn't uh, say that he was uh, prophesying about his death and resurrection. He never called himself the son of man or the son of God, two messianic terms. Their assertions were difficult to fathom. No other scholarship on Jesus or any other ancient historical figure imposes such stringent restrictions. They systematically destroyed the Jesus that many of us have come to put our faith in. What Jennings did not tell you was the presuppositions of these scholars, what they brought to the table as they analyzed the Bible. I want to tell you their presuppositions that caused them to come to such outlandish conclusions. And in doing so, I want to share with you four reasons some people, maybe many people today, do not believe the Bible. One reason many people do not believe the Bible is, is, is because they begin with an anti-supernatural bias. We've all grown up and been taught strict naturalism. That is, the world is only what we can see and touch. There is no God. There is no supernatural. God cannot intervene in this world. They began with the assumption that miracles cannot happen. So they assumed that the miracles we read about in the Bible, we today who've grown up in science can no longer believe that. So they, all of those are inauthentic. They take those out of the Bible. And then any conversations that occurred related to those miracles, you have to take those out too as being inauthentic. 
uh, since they rule out supernatural ph uh, phenomena, there can't be any prophecy. You can't predict something years before and then have it fulfilled. You have to throw all of that out of the Bible. Jesus can't predict the future like his death and resurrection. You have to throw that out. They say that the writers made this stuff up about Jesus years after his death. A deification of Christ is the only way they can explain their faith in him. They leave, leave us with a Jesus who has been stripped of his divinity. His atoning death and resurrection. And the Bible is nothing more than the wish, wishful thinking of unenlightened people. Given their assumptions, it's not surprising that they concluded Jesus was not born of a virgin, performed no miracles, and never rose from the dead. Their methodology predetermined their outcomes. The researchers were playing with a marked deck of cards. Is it not deceitful when the results of an investigation, when they're published, nothing is said about the fact that the conclusions were reached before they began their investigation? I think scholars should tell us their presumptions before they begin. Like, I don't believe that God intervenes in space and time. So I don't believe in any miracles. Or I don't even believe in God at all. And now here are my conclusions. A discussion of the Christmas story with scholars using the historical critical method, that's what this is called, the anti-supernatural assumption, might go something like this. Questioner, I hear you're investigating the Christmas story in the Bible. Scholar, yes, I plan to investigate the biblical accounts using the latest tools available to us. Those are the anti-supernatural historical critical historical tools. Questioner, do you have any preconceived results in mind? Scholar, no, of course not. I do not think one should predetermine the results of historical research. One should have an open mind. It's bad research to work with an agenda. I realize that we all have a tendency to have an agenda, but I personally believe that we should resist any attempt to make the results of historical critical research fit our own desires or beliefs. Questioner, then I assume that you are open to the possibility that Jesus was born of a virgin. Scholar, no, I never said that. Questioner, but I thought you said one should never predetermine the results of research. Scholar, what I meant was that you should never predetermine the results of historical critical research. Questioner, what's the difference? Scholar, oh, the difference is very significant. Historical critical research assumes that we live in a closed continuum of space and time. This means that miracles are excluded as a possibility. Questioner, then you've already predetermined certain results. After all, you excluded the possibility of Mary having conceived as a virgin. Scholar, yes, that's true. Questioner, then what are you seeking to investigate? Scholar, well, one of the big issues would be to seek to understand how the story of the virgin birth originated. Questioner, but it could not have originated through an actual virgin birth. Scholar, that's right. It couldn't have. Questioner, oh. <laughs> They had drawn their conclusions before they began their investigation. First time I read about the Jesus Seminar, I was surprised to learn that according to John Dominic Curson, co-chair of the seminar with Marcus Borg, that according to him, uh, Jesus' corpse was probably, after the crucifixion, probably laid in a shallow grave, just barely covered over with dirt, and his body was eaten by birds and wild dogs. And the story of Jesus' entombment was just made up. I thought, well, how did he draw that conclusion when uh, the consensus of scholarship is that Jesus' uh, body was put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea? Did he discover some new scroll outside Jerusalem? Turns out, as I read further, no. This was just his hunch. It's too bad that many in the media have allowed themselves to be deceived by their claims. It's frightening to think that thousands of people maybe saw Peter Jennings on ABC and concluded that, you know, now we know the Bible's not true. 
Second reason many people do not believe the Bible is because they begin with the assumption that people of faith do not report history accurately. The members of the Jesus Seminar assumed that faith caused biblical writers to embellish on actual fact and delve into pious myth-making. They exercised a kind of a cultural imperialism of the Enlightenment that assumed that it's only in the last 200 years we've learned how to write history. Ancient writers didn't know how to do this. Freely making things up and calling it history. Assuming that because a writer is passionately committed to a cause does not mean that they falsify the facts. Often such a person will work all the harder to get the story straight. After the Nazi Holocaust, many of the people who wrote about it were Jews. They wanted to make sure this never happened again. Luke, who was a follower of Christ, the writer of the third gospel, goes to great lengths to show us that he was writing an actual history of the life of Jesus. This is, uh, if you want to turn in your Bible, this is Luke chapter 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. By many, I assume he means Matthew, Mark, and John. Not quite sure who else he means. Uh, there might have been other disciples or followers of Jesus that wrote parts, you know, some about the life of Christ. But those have not survived. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses, these would be the 11 surviving disciples, and like Mary, his mother, and other followers of Christ, and servants of the word, like Paul, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. We get from, Luke was not an apostle. And uh, typically you have to be an apostle to get in the Bible or a prophet. Uh, but he was the companion of the apostle Paul and he carefully investigated. In other words, uh, we get the, the idea that he, he interviewed people like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and um, people uh, who were healed by Jesus. People that were at the crucifixion. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Sir William Ramsey, a, one of the best archaeologists ever to have lived, writes, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed with the very greatest of historians. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect to its trustworthiness. The third reason many people do not believe the Bible is because there is an ignorance of the Bible. These past five decades have been called the post-Christian age in America. Never before in the history of our country have so many people grown up never having gone to church or Sunday school, no religious education in their home. I mean, the number of people, let's say 30 and under, who have never been to church had no religious instruction. The number is astounding. As a result, uh, even among uh, people that go to church, there's a widespread ignorance of the Bible. So then when we read something or hear or see something on the news, it says, we now know Jesus didn't say any of these things. He didn't do any of these things. It's really hard to respond and refute these arguments. We spend more time watching television and looking at our cell phones than reading the Bible. People who do not know better, when they hear people say the Bible's not true, all we can do is throw up our hands in dismay. The fourth reason many people do not believe the Bible is because we do not want the Bible to be true so we can live however we want. We see this is particularly true of proponents of atheism who go around the world giving speeches. And you kind of ask, uh, did science propel you to this belief? Turns out, no, not at all. They don't want there to be a God. And so they're trying to pick holes in the Bible or in the Christian faith so they don't have to live as the Bible instructs. 
Now, you might wonder, why give a message about why many people don't believe the Bible? What a, what a way to start the new year. Does it really matter if the Bible is authentic? Can I keep my faith even if some things recorded in the Bible never happened? In the final analysis, isn't religion something that's a matter of faith? Is anything important in peril? In my opinion, the issues I'm raising in this four-week series, Can We Trust the Bible, are a matter of life and death. I don't believe I'm overstating that. Uh, I believe this series may be more important to you and your faith than anything else we talk about this year. Bruno Pierce, uh, one of our members, did a drawing of two people on a teeter-totter. And uh, one is, uh, we got that drawing? It's not over here. Okay, well, we'll do it this way. Uh, so one is uh, on one end, and he's shooting a gun at the other one. The irony is when he shoots him and hits his mark, he will die too. Because as the murdered man falls off the teeter-totter to his death, the other guy will be catapulted into the chasm. When we uh, destroy the foundation for belief in a reliable Bible, we destroy the foundation for our faith. For the Bible contains most of what we know about God and Christ. Just as the young girl in Van Dyke's story, the keeper of the light, fought to keep the lighthouse burning, you and I must take our stand for the reliability of the scriptures. These next three weeks, I want to share with you six reasons we can believe in an authoritative Bible. Don't miss these next three weeks. I think they'll be very important for you and your faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a little bit of what we talked today, where we get a little bit of understanding why there are people out there saying the Bible's not true and uh, there's all kinds of things wrong with it. And maybe we can understand a little bit of why. I want to give you a moment just to talk to God. Maybe you have doubts about the Bible. Tell him. Tell him what those are. Tell him you'd like to be here these next three weeks and you'd like to learn about this stuff uh, and that you want to develop a belief in the Bible and make the Bible part of your life this year. You pray. Father, thank you that we can believe that not only you are there, but you've communicated to us through a book inspiring the writers to write the truth and that we can build our lives around it. And we want to really look at that these next three weeks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.